We have reversed the, the <coughs> schedule on this. Luke Martin came in and suggested that we have the witnesses talk first because then it would make more sense when he walked through the bell. So that's what we're doing. So Matt, come on up and just, I know who you are, but the rest of the committee might not, so you can. Yes. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. So just. <coughs> Thank you, Ed. Thank you. I think we're back. Okay. Welcome. You know the routine, just introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, I'm Matthew Rubin. I live in Montpelier and uh, almost 40 years now. And uh, I own several, uh, two hydroelectric plants um, and <coughs> was one of the owners of the Winooski One project. Uh, and I'm here today to ask the committee to consider favorably a very small amendment, uh, really, to the standard offer bill uh, or the standard offer legislation. Um, and it regards, it, it regards existing hydro sites. Uh, as you probably know, standard offer really is for new projects, and we're not talking about any new hydro sites. Our concern, uh, is that I'm speaking as president of the Independent Power Producers Association. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, it's, there were, uh, when the independent program started in the mid-80s, there were long-term contracts, 20 and 30 years, and uh, there were about 52 megawatts of hydro sites that came online and are still online, but after their long-term contracts expired, um, there really was no option uh, for them under existing law, and because the statute under which the long-term contracts were basically lapsed. So they basically had to sell to the grid? That after the contract was up, there was no option other than selling to the grid, okay. your local you know, power. Right, so, so to the uh, local power company. Exactly. Which would then put it on. Okay. Hey, can, can I just ask, is this, this bill was in here, but Natural Resources has proposed an amendment, is that what we're talking about? I don't know that this bill was here. This well, bill just, wall, but it yeah. gets. Is it passed on the other, did we pass it on the other committee where I served? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they passed the other National Research Institute. But my understanding is this is S-170, which we don't have up there. It is. Okay. Yeah, okay. This got introduced like after crossover. I don't know. We heard about it a month ago. We heard about it, but I don't think we ever had a bill. It was a natural resource. It, it was, yeah, it got introduced. It got sent here. Senator Bray came over the same day it got introduced and asked me to send it to him because it was his bill. But this was all last week. And then we sent it back. And then we, right. and you sent it back here on Friday. But it did not make crossover. So if it's going anywhere, we are going to hear about an energy bill that's miscellaneous energy bill that's coming up. So if it's going anywhere, it'll probably go on there. Okay. Testimony, Madam Chair, would be the, the witnesses should understand that, that we'll find, if we like it, we'll find a place to put it. Yes, we will find a place to put it. Thank we you. love Christmas trees in this committee, and we decorate them. Thank you. Okay. So, just uh, briefly, uh, in 2012, you know, the legislature recognized that the long-term contracts on the Rule 4100 would be expiring. And so, um, within the standard offer legislation, a little section relating only to existing hydro projects, and it said that 
just as standard offer projects sell to the vacuum purchasing agent, that hydro sites would follow the same route, but that the output would be sold at the market price. Uh, okay, now you used to get a preferred price we, when it was small hydro under the original contract. It, it wasn't exactly preferred. It was a 20 or 30 year contract, rate. But it, in hindsight, it turns out to have been higher than the market right. price would have been, but. This came, I'm, this was before my time, but my understanding was I do remember the oil embargo. And there was a big push for some energy independence in this country. <laughs> because overnight, one, we kept one car in the neighborhood with gas in it for emergencies. Uh, yeah. So I, I thought these high, this real push to develop small hydro came out of that experience. It did, and, yeah, and the result was that uh, 150 megawatts of projects were proposed, and 75 got built, 50 hydro, and the Rygate wood chip plant. Um, and uh, all of these plants are in the Vermont uh, energy goals for 2030, so we're not proposing to do anything other than just keep them here. And so after the long-term contracts ran out, um, the question was what would these projects do? And the only option they had was to sell at the spot price to their local utilities who were uh, unenthusiastic about uh, any compensation for line losses or not really interested in any long-term uh, commitments. So. Um, the legislation that was passed in 2012 created a market rate. The average price of energy, taking a two-year moving average, the same thing, the ISO price for capacity, uh, an adjustment for line losses, depending on whether you were going through one transformer or, or two, and a, a premium for the long-term contract. 10 or 20 years, and finally an adder for the environmental attributes, which uh, now are called RECs. Um, so our, but the problem was the 2012 legislation had two clauses which effectively gutted the in legislative intent to make it a market rate. The first one said, no matter what happens to the price of electricity, the price paid to independent producers can't go up faster than the consumer price index. And back page is a chart of what happens historically, and at the price of energy went from testimony from last time? I wasn't given anything. Okay. I know that. If you look at the top line, um, the, you can see that the first rate was set pursuant to legislation by the Public Service Board, now the PUC, in 2013. And the rate cannot go up faster than inflation. And then the middle section is what the calculated rate would be under existing law. And then down below is the second statutory cap, uh, which means no matter what the rate was, it can't go up faster than inflation. And the bottom line is 
my dog might be thinking it's a dog. Uh, and uh, when you're hard of hearing sometimes, you know, aren't you going to answer your telephone? <laughs> so the, the real comparison is the actual orbit rate in red at the bottom uh, versus the calculated rate, which is the blue line. And the long and the short of it is that no one has ever signed up for this rate in six years because of the statutory cap, the two statutory caps, which effectively means the rate can't go up past the inflation even if the real world does. Uh, so inflation should be flat. So maybe last few months. All right. So Oh, we have a question. Can you just, in any case, we, I, can I just ask a question? Um, can you, I can imagine a little bit of the answer, but can you explain why it is not adequate to be selling on the spot market, on the spark, whatever it's called? It? it is adequate, and we would accept it, except that the, by taking the 24 month moving average, you smooth out some of the month to month and not to say hour to hour fluctuations. So But that's what that's where you're at now. At this point, if the project had no contract, they would have no choice but to sell to the local utility at the actual hourly rate, which you can find out online as a practical. So the so that's your option and that's I, I guess I'm not understanding the distinction. So, what, what, what do you call that? Because selling to the local utility. You'd be selling to the local utility, exactly. And that, what's wrong with that? Um, first thing is there's no long-term commitment. And, um, for example, the, we need my facility in Winooski and uh, Addie's project in uh, Wrightsville are all looking at relicensing hundreds of thousands of dollars of studies and so forth. And it's a very different situation if you don't know what the rate is going to be and for how long. So having a 10 or 20 year commitment with a premium of 5% for the 10 year and 10% and for the 20 year contract is a real benefit okay. to me. The spot standard. market is highly volatile, right? The, the, extremely so. Also, these sites are old. The, the turbines are 30 years old, and they will show you sites that are around for 100 years, especially up in the Northeast Kingdom. But the machinery does need to be significantly rehabbed, and that is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, kind of a decade old. So, the producers would like to make a long-term commitment that the power would be in Vermont and stay in Vermont. And are the utilities barred from doing that? Or they're just not motivated to do that? They weren't, they weren't significantly motivated, no. I mean, I would say that we talked to all the utilities, and I think it's fair to say that there is no objection from to, the utilities. So. Yeah. And, and uh, they won with one. When we originally had discussed it, um, especially with Green Mountain, and their concern was that the price for the RECs, the environmental attributes in the language of the bill, uh, that that not be set like tomorrow, but rather that it also evolve, it follow the two-year moving average. And we said, okay, that's acceptable. And so at this point, there's no no, you see one is still owned by you? No. Burlington so, Wire. That's why I was confused. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Sorry, okay. I'm just trying to get up to speak here. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been, I can't remember how long it's been since we played with standard offering here. So it, it takes a while yep. uh, to get our heads kind of wrapped around what's going on. <clears throat> 
we all have any concern about standard offer and it being extended. This is really outside of that discussion. Right. These are existing projects. Just, you've got an aging infrastructure, like many of us. They started with an aging infrastructure with new components. Okay. About 40 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And we had the old dams that had abandoned and put in new generators and new components. And they were rewarded with a standard offer for about 30 years of, which of a price that was above what you were going to get. And, and now they seek, this is where my words, they seek to get a, a, an, an average return like everyone else, and that's a return. And the, what they are following now doesn't work and isn't being picked up on, and they're providing an alternative way to get run of the mill prices. Okay. Pun intended, but, um, okay. And it's that's right. And something long term, so you have a long term investment stream. So you know you can invest the capital you're yes. going to need to. They've done it. No, but he's saying they're they're after 40 years they need a little. Work. I get a little nervous when the Waterbury Dam, that was the Army Corps, needed to be redone, and the word was we would have 20 minutes to notify the town of Waterbury before I believe it was a 20 foot wall of water went down Main Street um, if that dam failed. Uh, and it, minutes to run uphill. You got it, and there's no big hills in Waterbury. So it, it, the, the the dams, maintaining the dams is important. The, the cost of not maintaining them uh, could be catastrophic. I would not like for us to that level. And then these, these projects have been part of Vermont's energy supply for a long time, and we'd like them to continue to be. Is that it? We, we got talking, and I wanted to make sure you got more. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I will see if Washington Electric and Green Power feels threatened by this. Well, they're coming up next. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I've got Patricia Richards. Washington, like Michael, happy surprise. Or, I didn't hear her, just like, try to avoid it. It's a mix. It's a mix, yeah. Like, it's happening now. It's going to be happy with it. Okay. Hi. Hi. Thank you for asking me to come in. Patty Richards from Washington Electric Co-op, the general manager at Washington Electric Co-op. And Senator McDonald, to answer your question, is Washington Electric Co-op threatened? The answer is no. <laughs> Um, REC is a small utility. We are exempt from standard offer, but I still care about what's happening in the standard offer paradigm because in the event the exemption goes away, then that power we would be obligated to pay for it. So I'm here, I want to be completely disclosed that, that we currently have an exemption because we're 100% renewable. Our power supply is full up for the next 20 years. So if we took on standard offer power, it's just excess added on top of our resource mix, which we don't need. Um, the uh, proposal that's in front of you is a proxy for a market-based contract. It's not purely market-based because it, the energy doesn't flow. As the power is produced, the energy isn't paid on an hour-by-hour hour as it's produced, but it's pretty close. So it gives the developers, it gives the hydro operators some little bit of specificity. They can model and produce uh, power to maximize their revenue stream. And as Matthew said, we're all going in for FERC hydro relicensing. It's a very expensive process, so it's, it's attuned to basically either revamping your car or renovating and gutting your house and taking out a new mortgage. It's like you're establishing a new uh, facility. You basically have to gut the facility to some capacity and inject new parts and incur all of it expenses. So from an operator, owner of a hydro plant, I would want some specificity that I'm going to get paid for some uh, degree of time, 10 years, 20 years, or whatever that is. And, and also some project, ability to project what you're going to get paid and right. not 
Right, and, and the, the, the proposal is still a proxy relative to market with a two-year swing to smooth things out a little bit. But that any developer that's coming into the marketplace is going to look at a market projection and say, okay, what do I think I'm going to get in the marketplace? So it, it's, it's as if a utility is looking at that same economics. I'm looking forward for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. This is the revenue projection I expect to get. Then I base my finances on that revenue projection. So from WEC's standpoint, we do not have an objection to how this is laid out. It's fairly close to a market-based contract, so there's not a ton of risk to the ratepayer paying above market. The old contracts that were in place prior to the standard offer uh, allowance, they call them VPEX contracts or VEPI contracts, they were very expensive. At some point, somebody 25 years ago sat down and said, here's what I think power prices are going to be in 25 years. And of course, any, anybody that's estimating that long is going to get it incorrect. And in this case, they are, they're fairly, they're, for the utilities for WEC, it is our most expensive resource in the mix. The hydro plants and the projects are great renewable projects. It's just the rate we're paying for them currently under the VPEX DEPI contract, it's a premium. It's expensive. So this gives us a pretty good close proximity to market prices, so we have no objection. So this would make them much more marketable. Exactly. My understanding is they get taken up when all the other cheap resources were, were already, you know, when, when you had demand and you had to buy something that the small hydro was at the bottom of the list that the utilities would have just because, because of the price that you would access. Because they're also not dispatchable, so basically whatever they can generate is what we would take for that power. Right. That, that same, um, <laughs> same dynamic is still in place today. So whether it's a hydro plant or wind plant or anything, if it's an intermittent resource, whatever it can produce at that time is what it sends to the market. It's not a dispatchable resource. Unlike wind, isn't it pretty consistent? Like wind has a shape and a profile, hydro has a shape and a profile depending on the, the river characteristics, if you have ponding capability. Lot, lots of hydro this time of year. Yes. Shoulder. Not so much in August. Right. But in the southern part of our region in Connecticut and Massachusetts, there's natural gas fire power plants. They can be ramped up and down to yeah. fill in the void right. of when the renewables aren't producing. So. All the intermittent resources fill in the bottom of the, the bid stack for the ice of New England, and then later on the ice of New England fills it in to basically match the load shape. I think there was some old one, maybe that's the one, there's, there's one they fire up in Burlington as a true last resort. Probably a Peaker project. Yeah, maybe. Right. Yeah. I know there's one up there that's very expensive. Yes, it's, it's going to be an oil fired Peaker project. That's, yeah. yeah. And it just, it was. Damn, I mean, I would guess Winooski one is pretty consistent. That, I don't know, it seems like there's always water. So it's, it's going to take the shape of the, you know, the spring is going to be higher production yeah. because we have all of the melt and the rain. The fall is going to be a little higher production as well. In the summertime, it, there's like a valley. There wasn't a lot going over there last August and September. <laughs> it was, we were in drought, but push and drought condition. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Some of them object to this. Good to what you said, Senator Pearson. There's got to be someone that objects to this. Yeah, you, you may be surprised today. I always be suspicious of bills that everybody agrees on. Yeah, that's, that's true, too. If you days on the floor, I will take something that I think we'll be able to deliver this afternoon. So this is Warren Coleman. I'm here for GMP and for Vermont Electric Co-op. Um, I think what you've heard so far from, from Patty and, and Matthew summarizes the issue well. The way the pricing structure was set up, it was it was producing sort of an artificially unattractive uh, price for these types of projects. 
and um, GMP in particular, Doug Smith, who's their chief uh, power supply uh, executive, worked with, uh, with Matthew and some of his colleagues to look at the statute. And basically, when Luke goes through it, you'll see we sort of eliminated one of the two different, one of the two pricing structures. It was sort of, you can do this or you can do this. And it was also always sort of defaulting to the lower of the two. Um, so when Luke goes through it, you'll see how it sort of builds the price stack based on a rolling two-year average. And the one key piece that was touched on was that the renewable um, uh, energy credits, the RECs, were one of those things that were not floating. It was fixed, and that had the potential to, really quick, frankly, create a windfall and loss for both uh, the project owner or, or the ratepayers. So by, by having that float with the other pieces and track the... Uh, the market rate, it takes that volatility out for, for uh, basically for both parties. So um, with that change, GMP was uh, supportive of, of making this change. Um, switching hats real quick, Vermont Electric Co-op is, is fine with it, it's sort of neutral on it. Um, it doesn't see a problem with doing it, similar to what you heard from, uh, from Patty earlier. Okay, questions? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, Right. Even if we don't understand what you say, everyone likes it. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Luke Kamara, uh, Chief Counsel of General Assembly. And I'm here on S-170. And all of you should have a copy, I think, in front of you. And it is the, um, it's actually the strike call amendment from. Okay, um, it's not the bill was introduced. That is both. correct. You should have the strike call amendment. Yes. Yeah. So I think you've had an excellent introduction from the other witnesses. I'll go through the statutory language. And as always, please stop me if anything's unclear. So this is amending 30 VSA 8005-a, <laughs> which is the bill. <laughs> pertaining, you know, so I just, I just keep blazing ahead, which is the bill pertaining to the standard offer. And as a witness has indicated, we're only talking about section P as in Peter, which is what concerns small hydro. So the first page of your handout, really nothing's been changed. That's the existing law. I want to start, though, at the very last two lines. I, if we have the same copy, it says the term includes hydroelectric plants that have never had such an agreement and hydroelectric plants for which such a turning over to page two the agreement has expired. Then you see there's language that's been stricken out. The current statute says provided that the expiration date is prior to December 31st, 2015. So we're past that time. This proposal would eliminate that language. In other words, it would no longer be that time limit. If you keep going down into the middle page two, you'll see some of the substantive changes. So right now, as Mr. Coleman indicated, it's an either or price structure. You'll see under three, under capital A, um, under current law it says, Unless inconsistent with the applicable federal law, the price of a standard offer contract shall be the lesser of the following, and under current law, either eight cents per kilowatt adjusted for the CPI after 2013, or and then there's a list of various factors that are rolled into the other alternative. What this bill would do is eliminate that first eight cents a kilowatt adjusted for the CPI. That's taken away. Instead, the price would be set by all those other factors. And those factors are basically retained except for one change. They're renumbered, they're reorganized, but it's basically the same factors and a rolling average of various current factors with the additional line either 18 or 19, the market value of the RECs, of the environmental attributes. And as was indicated to you right now, that is not a two-year rolling average of the environmental attributes. Under this bill, it would be a two-year rolling average, like it is for the other factors that are considered in setting that price. If you go to now page three, um, you'll see under four, capital A, it says that the commission, in other words, the PUC, shall recalculate and adjust the various factors. And now environmental attributes are included in that because, once again, they're no longer the spot price, they're the rolling two-year average. That's the rest. Yes. 
You'll see down in the middle of the page on lines 10 through 12, there's underlying language that the commission may periodically adjust the value of the environmental attributes. That language is actually in current law. It's at the bottom of the page. It's simply being moved up. So that is not new language. It's just being reorganized. If you go over now to page 4, this is another substantive change. You'll see under number 5, you'll see that there's a paragraph that's uh, crossed out. And what that paragraph says in current law was that in no event shall an existing hydro plant receive a price in one year higher than the price in the previous year. And that's what Mr. Rubin referred to. You can't have a price higher than the preceding year. That language would be deleted. So that would no longer be so that the plant could get a price higher than the preceding year if under the rolling average of all those factors we talked about, that was determined to be the appropriate price. And then finally, there's to be some renumbering on the rest of page four, and you have the effective date, which would be July 1st of 2019. Are there any questions or is anything unclear? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I think, committee, we will allow this to settle so we can let it kind of regurgitate. And um, we will take this up for a vote. Actually, this one, I think, to go has to go on an H bill. And we do have the next week miscellaneous energy bill i think so we'll uh that's probably a good place to put it i have to confess i don't entirely understand this no I, I, I mean i'm looking at, the, like at, at some of the calculation here uh in which the contract will be the sum of the following elements and then the last element is the value of a 10 or 20 year contract I haven't a clue what the value of a 10 or 20 year contract is or where that number comes from. Yeah. That, that's item one. But then when I see that it cannot, when I go over to page four, Maybe we should have someone from the commission come in and talk to us about how they do this. In, in other words, that the, the, it, the calculation in the future year cannot be greater than. Well, that's that's, the that's, that's, the, that's an existing language. How they got that, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but again, those some some of the, the, that that calculation said the. So I'm trying to find, I haven't a clue where those we'll numbers ask, come from or we'll, what they mean. Let's ask the um, utility commission, whoever does this calculation, to come talk to us in simple English. Did that work? Okay. Can I reach down? What? This is a small organization, and the notion was that they had a. Uh, 30 year contract, they no longer do. Two small potatoes now, I would say, like a professor emeritus after the big earning years. Mm -hmm. And um, they're not going to get a 20 year contract. So I think what they're accepting is we'll take this formula until as long as we can produce power and we'll accept the rates that other people get for producing the same amount of power and, um, and, not, and not expect to get a guarantee will go with the well, of, of where the electric prices go. And that's the question. If we can yeah. get that verified from the PUC, how the PUC says that's, that's the effect yeah. of what's happening even if you don't if you don't, yourself, don't understand it yeah. inside parts and it, that, right. that is benign or not harmful to the system. I think that's that's, fine. that's yeah. my understanding. No matter what all of that says, they are getting essentially market rate, whereas the 30 years, they had a guaranteed rate that by the end, or probably That's about the middle, was substantially above market. But it's a done deal with right. early, gone. earlier. I don't, uh, yep. one of the, perhaps it was uh, let's say council waited to 
the right aid plan, which mm -hmm. they picked up the mortgage for X number of years. So that plan, when the mortgage ran out, now right aid gets the market. They get the market. We, had, we, we're we not, were not we're focused on the cost yeah. of power. We were focused on the availability. It was kind of like a hedge fund in case yeah. other people didn't know. And tried to hedge for it. Okay. And this is that rolling, the, the rolling average button. They're assured it's 10 years. We'll give you this rolling average for the next 10 years, right? That's, is that what we're doing? But then again, it was, what's the value of a 10 or 20 year contract? Yeah, what does that mean? That's, that's I, I don't understand that. I don't, somebody here may be able to explain. The value to who? Okay, Mr. Rubin. It's really no different than buying any commodity. You can buy it at the spot market, or you can say, I'll take a long term contract. Mm -hmm. And that commitment is of value to both the buyer and the seller. And they decide that we'll do it that way. Many utility contracts are based that way. And so, as a, as a producer, I'd like to know that. And if I borrow money from the bank, they want to know that there is a power purchase agreement for a decade or two. And the, the fluctuation in the market is inherent the risk of the business. But mm -hmm. There is a market for the power. That's really the reason for it. And I think that between that the utilities have decided, and the Department of Public Service, that those premiums, 5% or 10% of the penalties, um, is reasonable. And, uh, I have a question, I think, for Luke, that this did get wrapped up in our standard offer program from 2012 or whatever. And is this taking that, divorcing those two? I, I think they're already quite divorced. It's in the same statute, but I is its own little world. Okay. Um, so I don't think this bill affects anything else on standard offer. That I don't understand, but it, this sort of, it sounds, as if I remember from a month ago, Hydro got sort of bizarrely impacted by the, what I think of as, as our standard offer project. <clears throat> and, and so I just want to make this is sort of undoing that. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yeah, no one's taken. Yeah, no, yeah, no one has taken up the standard offer in Hydro. Not on Hydro. Right. right. Which tells you there's a problem. Well, the way it was constructed was weird. Yeah, I mean, I think it we was. did that to, to pump out so much. Mean, we did some weird stuff. <laughs> Wind and by that kind of seems to work. Yeah. 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 Committees can do weird stuff before things get through. There's a reason it didn't scare them off of the bill. And the reason <clears throat> is the subtlety of transmission. The standard offer allows essentially for generation to be pooled and allocated to all the utilities pro rata except for the ones that already have met their Vermont goals. And that's the reason that it was included in standard offer because when you start dealing with how would, what is, 17, 18 utilities now? It's a bizarre situation in the real world. And so how does utility A transmit the power to the other 16 utilities. And so the standard offer kind of socializes the whole thing and makes it a great deal simpler and also doesn't run afoul of the FERC rules about you can't transmit power as much. So it's just in the interest of simplification on one. So socialism is simple and fair. Is that what you've heard? <laughs> At least when it comes to power. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we will, we will have to ask somebody from the commission to come over and just see if you can help us understand what, we, what these elements are and how they assess them. Okay? Okay. Anybody else? All right. That's it for this one. We have somebody from Efficiency Vermont who is supposed to be here at 3 
This is Rebecca. Oh, that's the, that's the, that's the boss. Yes, and she's uh, asked to just come in and talk to us a little bit because yep. this is their day. I think it's Welcome. Perfect timing here. Have a seat. Thank you very much. I just need you to tell us who you are. We represent, just for the record, we know. Certainly, Rebecca. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Rebecca Foster. I'm the Director of Efficiency Vermont. Thank you for the opportunity today to come speak with you about some of the updates Efficiency Vermont has been making uh, in 2019. I have a slide deck I want to pass out with some information about how we're changing and what we're doing uh, that's maybe new and different for the committee. So, black and white version. Yep, giving you a color. Sure. Okay. Great. Okay, we've got enough to go around. That's great. No, no, I think we need one for Brian. I have one. We need Okay. Thank you. Ready to go. Okay. All right. So, uh, we're going to start out with a little bit of background, then uh, focus on some of the key themes uh, under my leadership at Efficiency Vermont. I've been the director now for four months, and I'm new to the role, so there's a lot that's okay. happening I that's do anything in four months. new and different. I work quickly, so you'll see throughout the presentation. So uh, I'll focus on operational efficiency, delivering more value to customers, and partnerships. And then toward the end, if there are questions about the energy savings account pilot, we can get into that as well. To start off, I assume that most of you are familiar with Efficiency Vermont. There is a slide on who we are. Really, the highlights are that we were developed um, as a result of a legislative act uh, and began operations in 2000, so we've been around for nearly 20 years. We are administered by Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, a nonprofit entity with dedicated staff and a dedicated brand, Efficiency Vermont. And we're regulated by the Public Utility Commission on three-year cycles. We have a performance contract, uh, and we work kind of over each three-year period uh, with a various you know, budgets and savings metrics, mostly uh, dri driving toward delivering megawatt hour reductions in energy cost, of energy usage throughout the state. Um, the next slide, history of efficiency, talks about where we came from. Um, this is pre-efficiency Vermont. There was a real patchwork of energy efficiency programs around the state. We served, you know, 22 utilities having different programs, different uh, incentive levels, different requirements for um, contractors and builders to comply with. So really difficult to get the kind of scale needed to transform an industry or give home performance contractors or builders the right um, information and requirements um, to follow. Um, so the energy efficiency model, which is what we run now at Efficiency Vermont, is really focused on um, transparent performance, statewide equity, thinking about um, delivering services and required to deliver services across different uh, counties in an uh, equitable way based on population. We're independent from the utility, so uh, we've, we're kind of really focused on the customer, focused on helping them meet their goals, um, and as I mentioned, a performance-based approach. So um, this is not cost of service regulation or anything like that. This is really about setting the goals that the state has for us and then us um, complying and delivering year after year after year. So the next slide gets into some of those results. Um, efficiency works. So you can see that the work that we've done since 2000 now accounts for 16% of electricity use in the state. Um, so what that means is that another way, without Efficiency Vermont services over the last 20, 20 years, Vermonters would be buying 16% more electricity than they are now. Um, that's a big deal, and they'd be buying it more expensively. So we've got some uh, comparisons here. Uh, we know based on our you know, budgets and all of the you know, savings that we generate, we know we're able to deliver a kilowatt hour of uh, energy savings at about 3.6 cents. Uh, comparing that to the cost of electric supply, about 8.4 eight cents. So you say 3.6 cents. Mm -hmm. Is that taking the tariff fee 
on our lines and, and dividing that by the, the kilowatts you've saved? Correct. So it's the energy efficiency charge that's charged on all you know electric bills. Uh, we know what we get you know every year through that charge. We know that's our budget for the year, um, and then we can just divide that by the savings that we generated in a year to get the math um, about what it costs us to generate a kilowatt hour of savings. Um, so it's very. Um, Positive. It's you know good numbers to, to point to, and you know basically the bottom line is that it costs less to save energy than it does to go procure it or buy it, and we see that year after year. And this comes up um, as you know we have to answer for your charge, uh, which we itemize on electric bills, mm -hmm. and it's somewhere right down nine percent. Yeah. We pay nine percent for the under electricity bill for efficiencies. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in a at the front of a room in a town hall or something and somebody complains, which could just happen, <laughs> um, would it be would it be accurate to say, well, that charge is nine percent on our everybody's electric bill, and it has saved us sixteen percent, and so sort of absent that, we would anticipate paying another sixteen percent on your bill. Yep, higher bills for sure. Uh, efficiency has helped to keep bills low over time, so that's um, one point of fact. Uh, the other on the, the next slide might also help to answer that question. That's a number that I use I don't quite think a bit. There's a direct correlation that says you, you bill with 16% higher. Overall, Vermonters would use 16% more electricity, and they would have to purchase that electricity at a higher rate. So the relationship is not exactly 9 to 16%. Um, but we know that efficiency helps keep the bills low um, because it is a less expensive mechanism to procure our electricity supply. Okay. The other um, way that I answer that question, Senator, when I am asked is uh, on the next slide here, thinking about the overall lifetime value of Efficiency Vermont. So since 2000, uh, if you total up all of the efficiency Vermont budgets year after year after year, um, those total to $600 million. So that's a significant investment that the state has made in efficiency. And if you total up all of the energy savings and the costs that we you know, have saved customers year after year after year, um, that number adds to $2.5 billion. So with an investment of $600 million, we've been able to pay back you know, the state in energy savings $2.5 billion. So um, that's another way to answer the question about the cost benefit is to look overall at what we've generated time after time. Um, there are also greenhouse gas uh, reductions that are listed here on the slide, um, basically 12.5 billion metric tons, um, equivalent to over 2 million cars um, being off the road because of the work that we've done. The yes. question that you've been at this now for 20 years, is the low-hanging fruit all gone? Great question. Um, one of the my favorite answers that I, I heard uh, director of the national uh, organization give to that question is, the great thing about efficiency is that the low-hanging fruit grows back. Um, so we have gone out and procured you know, lots of efficient lighting savings, and we've helped people transition from incandescent lamps to CFLs and now to LEDs. Um, the great news is that those technologies and other technologies continue to improve. So one of the functions of Efficiency Vermont that's really behind the scenes is to look at all of these emerging technologies to identify where are the future savings going to come from and then work with the manufacturers and the distributors and the contractors to make sure that the next generation of efficient technologies is going to be available for Vermonters so we can continue to see these savings over time. Just logically, if I'm devoting a major effort annually for a 20-year period uh, weatherizing my house, eventually it's going to be weatherized. If everyone in the state took that same step um, and went 100% efficiency, I, I see the logic. Um, but what we know is that we haven't reached everyone with efficiency yet. So we have an amazing database of customers throughout the state that have participated in some way. Uh, but usually people are taking one or two actions. So these savings are generated by you know, a homeowner uh, when their dishwasher breaks, you know, going and buying an Energy Star dishwasher and receiving an incentive for doing that. And then maybe it'll be three years from that point when they'll decide to change the lighting in their home. And then maybe it's another two years when their furnace breaks and then they're doing something about that. 
Um, so we know people take steps at different times, um, and during those periods when they're not taking action, that's when we're working to make sure that the next time they go to the store, the next time they interact with an HVAC contractor, they have the most efficient option to choose from, and that we're helping um, buy down the cost differential so that they can afford to make the efficient choice when they're ready. So this, this figure on cars is re remarkable. Um, if you remove 2.6 million cars from the road every year, why is Shelburne Road so crowded? Yeah. <laughs> if I live off of Shelburne Road, so I would love it if it were less crowded. Um, that would be great. Um, now, what do, you, what do you do for cars? Uh, so it's a great question. Right now, the scope of Efficiency Vermont is solely buildings. So we work mainly in electric efficiency, mainly in buildings. We do a little bit of work oh, okay. in so thermal. This is not for cars. Yeah, this is not about taking cars off the road, literally, or making them electric vehicles. This is the equivalent um, car emissions, just to something to put the 12 and a half um, number into context. And is, is that... Uh, based on our actual energy portfolio or if we were using, I mean, we're, we're fairly green grid, so uh, I'm just curious. Yep, those are based on Vermont numbers of, um, even in Vermont with our um, energy mix, uh, energy supply mix the way it is and moving more and more renewable all the time, those are the savings we're still able to generate. Were there any studies done, um, I'm a dinosaur, so I was back when you were established, um, to show projected paths of energy savings from the individual utilities versus what you were able to accomplish? I am not aware of any study that has been done that would look at that. Um, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the way that things are changing. So what we've just been talking about is really the past and what Efficiency Vermont has been able to do uh, in the past, um, but we know that things are changing. We know in the energy system, for example, efficiency is not the only tool in our toolkit. Uh, we know utilities are working on their Tier 3 programs. We know that customers are now interested in renewables, they're interested in storage, they're interested in um, peak reduction, they're calling us to ask how they can reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so things are changing in the energy system. We also know that in Vermont, um, we have changes of a demographic nature, we have economic challenges that we um, really feel acutely now that maybe were not so acute in the past. Um, so the map that you see here on the slide talks about uh, total energy burden. So this is some analysis that VEIC did, the parent organization, a few years ago. We're actually in the process of updating it now. And any of the red that you see on this map means that the average um, resident in that town pays more than 20% of their income on their energy bills. Um, that includes transportation, so it's electricity, home heating, and transportation. So we can see there's a lot of areas of the state that really need additional support. You know, 20 percent of your income on energy is a big deal, um, especially given you know some of the economic challenges we already know are facing people in these regions. So, you know, this is a, an an important fact, and it's one I wanted to bring uh, to this room because one of the ways that Efficiency Vermont is now regulated by the Public Utility Commission um, is focused on geographic equity, and it's focused on making sure that our benefits of efficiency programs match the population centers. Um, so we actually deploy our resources um, to make sure we meet that performance metric, um, but that means we're putting more resources into Chittenden County uh, where all of the blue is, and we're putting fewer resources where there are fewer people, um, and those parts of the state where the red is, where actually the need is greater. So we're working with the PUC now on that topic. It's just what I wanted to provide visibility on for this group. So we know the times are changing. Um, the next few slides, I'll talk about how Efficiency Vermont is changing as well. I'm going to talk through uh, some work on operational efficiency, some work on customer value, and some work on um, improving our partnerships with different stakeholders in the state. So the first slide on operational efficiency. This is showing, uh, since our inception in 2000, uh, what the, the cost effectiveness looks like. So this is a cost benefit. The blue lines um, that you can see, the smaller lines, are our budget. That's the cost side of the equation. So this is just our electric budget, since that's the vast majority of what we work with. The green lines are the savings that we generate with that budget each year. 
So you know you can see the ratio is, is quite good. This is what we want to see. We want to see a lower investment and a higher return. Um, and you'll see over to the right-hand side of the page um, projected flat budgets uh, for 2018, 19, and 20. So this is something that was important to us the last time we went to the PUC and talked to them about how Efficiency Vermont needs to reflect the changing economic environment in the state. We didn't think it was appropriate to continue to grow Efficiency Vermont's budget, so we wanted to make sure that we went in with a flat budget to keep that energy efficiency charge flat over time. And then above that, what I'm happy to report is that in 2018, we engaged in a really serious organizational effort to reduce our cost. So every year up until then, we have been you know, rewarded and encouraged to go ahead and spend up to the full budget allotment by the Public Utility Commission. Um, this year, we didn't do that. This year, we spent $2.3 million less while achieving our goals. Um, so that took a lot of internal work, but we thought it was the right decision to do, to tighten our belts, get more and more efficient internally and then reflect that savings back to electric ratepayers in the form of a reduced energy efficiency charge in the future. So that's something that we would like to continue. We're working to continue this year and next year. And we're really looking to see how much we can push Efficiency Vermont Systems Services uh, staff people to really go the extra mile, do more with less, and try and um, reduce the cost of these programs while we continue to deliver the same high quality benefits. So that's an important point. At the same time, on the next slide, you'll see a few points on customer value. You know, we're committed to changing our programs to try and meet the most serious and pressing challenges that face the state. Um, there's two that I want to draw attention to, really, in terms of the Vermonters that we serve. One is small businesses. So. We have for years um, had a group of engineers and account managers that work with the 100 largest businesses in the state. And so we go out to those businesses um, every week, uh, every day. We, we're there, we're working with them, we're on their sites and their facilities, and we're talking to them about how they can reduce their energy costs and save energy. That's a level of service and a level of personal attention that was not available to small and medium businesses before now. Uh, but we've created something called a business energy walkthrough. And uh, that's where we take those same field staff, we take them uh, and we are deploying them now in much smaller organizations, going out to mom and pop shops, going out to convenience stores, going out to kind of neighborhoods, um, restaurants, those sorts of venues. Uh, and we're finding really good uptake. About 35% of the businesses we visit in this program um, turn around and they do an energy project. And they've said, you know, we're just the small business owners, so we're so pressed for time, we don't have the resources, we can't figure this out on our own. We need someone to come help us. So that's the way that we're helping to contribute to economic vitality of that particular we group. Asked you to do that last year. Excellent. I'm so glad. <laughs> Yep, uh, it's one of my favorite programs. Um, similarly, small um, to small businesses, there's also a focus on low and moderate income residents, both homeowners and renters. And with that group, really unique needs, there's a lot of different ways that we need to reach out um, to that population and make it easy for them to take action. Um, and they face unique challenges in terms of affordability, access, time. So we're really taking um, a hard look at all of our programs to say how can low-income people participate in this um, and we're creating separate programs specific to low-income um, to help offset their energy costs and reduce um, the amount that they pay. One example of that is we're working right now with Capstone on a pilot where we would go um, together to the people who are on the waiting list for weatherization, who are between 60% um, and 80% of area median income, and we together would offer them an option. If you could stay on the wait list if you'd like, or if you want services sooner, here's a package from Efficiency Vermont that um, you could participate in. And the package would include for weatherization services, um, increased incentives that are more than a, a typical homeowner would get. It would include 0% financing, so if they needed 
to take out a loan, you know, we could help them do that at zero percent. Um, and it would include kind of the connection to the contractors uh, who are market rate contractors and we've gotten their agreement to participate in this um, with a fixed price list so that we're able to just make this offer to every person on that waiting list. Um, there is a glitch in terms of getting that uh, off the ground which is just access to the, the waiting list um, families. So we're working now through some channels to try and get access and make this offer and see how that works. And, and I will give you a heads up. I believe we have a two cent increase in the fuel mm -hmm. tax coming our way. I was thinking I joined Community Action, which is now Capstone. Mm -hmm. um, when my daughter was a newborn, she turned 41 three weeks ago. We were doing the weatherization of low income homes then. We've been doing it it's a for at least 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I understand, you know, then we could put up plastic and now we can put it in furnaces that the low hanging fruit has joined. But I'm trying to, after 40 years, to say who's got a map? Because the housing stock outside of Chittenden County has not changed very much in 40 years. Who's got a map that says? I also sold real estate, and I would say to, to see a house that was weatherized, mm -hmm. which is the selling point, mm -hmm. was fairly rare. Mm -hmm. I'm dealing in more middle-income homes, but I'm trying to get a sense of when are we done and when do we move into that more middle-income mm -hmm. area, which, you know, and, and where do we invest limited state funds? Mm -hmm. um, and I have a feeling that you may know part of those answers, yeah. but not all of them. Yep. So when we get to that, just a heads up. Certainly. That I'm happy to come back and talk about that. Yes. Sure. That's great. Okay. okay. So the other thing I wanted to add on this customer value slide um, is working, and this is a segue to the next slide, working through partnerships to address needs that maybe we couldn't address before. The capstone pilot example is one good example of that. Um, but we also see a role for Efficiency Vermont in ensuring that the utilities electrification programs that are working through Tier 3 are you know, efficient as possible. So we've had some good um, dialogue and some good collaborative program delivery with really all of the utilities in the state, you know, helping with Tier 3 programs. Um, we have now built a delivery vehicle for coal climate heat pump programs so that any of the distribution utilities that wants to promote coal climate heat pumps as part of their Tier 3 programs can participate with Efficiency Vermont and just jump right onto that infrastructure that we've built and kind of easily keep um, their program going in their area without needing to add all of the program infrastructure um, to their uh, operations. So that's something we'd like to see more of. Uh, and that's a segue to this partnership slide. So um, one example that we use, and it's not um, unique at this point, but it is something that we want to draw attention to is the example of Brattleboro Retreat. So this is an example where Efficiency Vermont partnered with Green Mountain Power and with a small organization out of the southern part of the state called Dynamic Organics. And we worked with them to make use of an existing ice storage facility to cut their cooling costs uh, in the summer by $20,000 a year. And how it works is kind of demonstrated here by this chart. Um, you can see these two stars represent, you know, on a given summer day, what are electricity prices looking like? You know, there's some parts of the day, 3 o'clock in the morning, you can buy electricity fairly inexpensively. Um, then, you know, as you get to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you get up to $380 per megawatt hour. So that's when electricity prices are very high. That's when companies tend to incur demand charges on their bills. Um, and that's when Vermont's entire um, population is really impacted by usage at that point because those high peaks set the rates for everyone in the state. Um, so the more we can bring those peaks down, the more we can lower power costs for everyone. So what we did with GMP and Dynamic Organics was to work with Battleboro Retreat to kind of make use of this existing system that they had, 
find some technical fixes and solutions so that they could make ice uh, in the middle of the night when the electricity costs are low, store that ice throughout the day, and then uh, when they needed to, on those really peak, uh, hot, hot summer afternoons, instead of making cold water with compressors and then piping that through their buildings to cool the buildings down, they ran the cold water through the ice and used the ice to cool the water and then ran the water through the buildings. So they got cool buildings um, from ice storage rather than through air conditioning. It's yes, a chiller system. the old heat storage that went in and has been taken out of most of the condos and most of the mm -hmm. downloaded and heated bricks, stones, something. And really? then, yeah. Same and principle. Oh, and yeah. Night, same principle, the, this one was heating. Mm -hmm. And then during the wow. day, you're, you wear over mm -hmm. the hot stone. Huh. And you're buying yeah. electricity when it's below the market rate, yes. and you're avoiding its use when it's well above the market rate. Oh, Except sure. there was, if you ran out of hot water, you paid a very high rate. Ever. OK. So if the family came to visit, <laughs> took an extra shower, you yeah. were yeah. in trouble. Yeah. There was literally like an emergency switch. Oh, my. You had to yeah. throw. Yeah, so similar concept. I think you know we hear a lot about storage as one of the new exciting energy technologies, and uh, the reason I like to use this example is because this was an old ice storage. It's not a lithium-ion battery. It's not a Tesla power wall, um, but it really works, and it's saving their trade twenty thousand dollars a year that they can then put into delivery of services to Vermonters that need them. Um, so it's a great story. It wouldn't have happened also without each of these entities coming together. You know the retreat interested in doing more, a very progressive energy manager who wants to try projects like this, Efficiency Vermont, who is able to work with them and deploy our engineers on the project to make sure that everything was going to work as expected and we wouldn't get surprised by anything on the other side. Um, Green Mountain Power, who had to come to the table with you know, a very innovative rate to make sure that the customer saw these savings. Um, so it, it took a lot of um, engineering from Dynamic Organics, this firm uh, down in the southern part of the state, to really pull this all together. And when we can work like this as partners with these different um, segments of the energy system coming together, that's where I think the next generation of savings will come from um, because we'll be able to look together at new ways um, to generate energy cost reductions for customers that maybe look different than they have looked in the past. So the other uh, topic I wanted to touch on, uh, oh, question. Well, no, Okay, um, just the, the next slide talks about Act 150, the Self-Managed Energy Efficiency Program. I know this was a topic of conversation in the committees last year, and I just wanted to provide an update. Um, so this is uh, basically the Energy Savings Account Pilot, is um, the current nomenclature, yeah. and it provides flexibility for larger energy users to retain their energy efficiency charge funding and then use that in various ways in their facilities that might be different than they could have used it under the traditional energy efficiency charge and the traditional efficiency remote program. Um, so the way that the pilot works is it's a three-year term um, up to 20, up to, sorry, two million dollars total in energy efficiency funds um, will be used. And importantly, the projects can include electric efficiency, but they can also include demand response, uh, which is really kind of moving that peak down um, to try and reduce energy use at a given time and reduce demand charges. Um, energy storage, as we were just talking about, and also energy productivity. So if a, an organization wants to add another line um, to its facility, uh, maybe its overall energy use goes up, but maybe it only goes up by half uh, than as it would have otherwise because energy efficiency was a part of the mix. Um, so this is working its way through a Public Utility Commission process right now. We issued at Sufficiency Vermont an RFI, Request for Information, in the uh, winter to really understand what the demand would be, what kind of businesses are interested in this, what kind of projects are they thinking about, what questions do they have, and what advice do they have as we're working with the partners to put the pilot together. 
we got a great response. Um, over 20 uh, organizations responded. And if we add up all of their energy efficiency uh, charge contributions, um, they added to more than the two million that's available annually. So um, we know that this will be a you know, very high interest pilot. We know that when we actually see the RFP issued in May by the PUC, that likely there will be more interest than available funds. So um, we're working through that now and trying to <coughs> encourage um, all sorts of companies to submit the best responses that they can. We'd like to see geographic diversity. We'd like to see a range of industries represented. Um, and you know, to us, the, the really exciting thing about this, speaking for Efficiency Vermont writ large, is we would like to see what we can do here, what kind of savings we can generate that then could be brought to the larger portfolio. So moving this from just a small pilot, um, you know, we're planning for our next three-year cycle, just getting started. Um, that cycle starts in 2021. So the early learnings from this, we would love to be able to incorporate in the bulk of the program going forward, especially this flexibility point around not just electric efficiency reductions, but also other benefits um, that we know will accrue to the grid, like demand response, storage, flexible load management. That was my question. Oh, great. Perfect. Uh, so what's next? Efficiency Vermont, you know, as you would expect, is working um, quite a bit across the street with the Public Utility Commission. Um, right now, there is a proceeding on energy efficiency utility regulations. So Efficiency Vermont, Burlington Electric, and Vermont Gas all need to comply with a series of regulations that govern all efficiency utilities. Um, and the PUC is asking questions there like, um, just as we've been talking about, you know, what's, what are the right metrics? What's the right planning process? Should we continue to um, regulate efficiency utilities completely separately from distribution utilities? Or is there any role for overlapping goals and collaboration on these projects that may require um, multiple perspectives and multiple entities to pull off? Uh, and at the same time, we're just beginning planning for the next program cycle that begins in 2021, and really asking the PUC um, how they would like us to orient our programs. Um, do they want us to continue to focus on megawatt hour reductions? Um, do they want us to focus on other things? How do we think about geographic equity? Um, should we be thinking about economic equity in an, you know, as an alternative? Um, so that we can address that energy burden map that I showed. What is the role of efficiency Vermont in transportation? You know, should we be helping with the supply chain development there and working with dealers to get more electric vehicles available to Vermonters? Those are the kinds of things that we're working through with the PUC. So um, are you like a partner with the PUC or do they actually issue orders? They regulate the efficiency of Vermont. So we are regulated by the PUC. We go to them with formal proposals and work through dockets um, so that we can get clarity about our metrics. And then they're the ones that hold us accountable to meeting those uh, goals over time. So while we would love to approach things as a partnership, there is a relationship there that's um, definitely not equal. <laughs> but you, you, you propose things to them, yes. and then they would review them and say, we want this tweak or that. Yes. Yes. And a, another partner I'd like to emphasize as well is the Department of Public Service. Um, so they're also part of the mix. They're a great you know, thinking partner and kind of a first line regulator. So what we'd like to do and what we're working to do now is you know, envisioning a future um, where Efficiency Vermont the distribution utilities, the Department of Public Service, all could come together to talk about how we think these kinds of programs could be most effective um, and presenting that in concert to the PUC. I'm not sure if we'll get to that point, but that's the approach that I'm taking with the team, um, much more collaborative than in the past. So uh, the 9% that you were talking about before, I mean, that sounds kind of high in terms of you know, how do you get there? I mean, I, I don't question mm -hmm. that it's worthwhile to invest that amount to get the return you're getting. But is it um, a question you go to the PUC and say, we can get more from ratepayers, we can deliver this, and they approve that rate? No, we do. We do? We approve the rate? Yeah. Each year? Or? It goes back to oh, Senator Brock's question of, aren't you running out of low-hanging fruit, which a question that wasn't, which is yet to be answered for the Senator Schrockman's question. Yeah. And that's the same question that's hanging up. 
So the process that we take with the PUC and the department is very rigorous. Um, and each time we approach a three-year cycle, um, we do a lot of technical analysis to, to be able to prove out that the investments that Efficiency Robot makes will pay back and that they will result in benefits that are far greater than the investment itself. Um, and that kind of technical analysis includes getting down to a detailed level, asking questions like how many um, you know, refrigeration systems do we envision being able to change out in gas stations, uh, you know, coolers across the state of Vermont over the next three years. And even something as minute as that has to be backed up and justified with a rationale that we have some data point and a report that says there's, you know, 80,000 of these systems in the state and we're going to go, we think that 10% of those each year for the next three years is appropriate and we know the cost of the incentive will need to be in order to reach that level of performance. Um, so you know, I don't want to leave the impression that setting the energy efficiency rate in the budget is arbitrary because it's not. Um, it's a very rich process and then we'll have others around the table at the PUC um, picking apart all of those assumptions and saying, well, I don't think there's 80,000 refrigeration systems and gas stations that need to be changed out. I think it's really like 60,000. And I don't think you can get 10% a year. You can only get five. So let's reduce your budget that way. So in the past, that's, that's how the process has worked. We've really started from um, the guidelines that the PC provides and the statute provides of what is the cost effective efficiency we can procure and then we've constrained it by uh, what's actually achievable given the time that we have and the market that we have and the technology that's available uh, to us and we, we work back from all cost effective efficiency back to what we actually think we can get mm -hmm. and at each point <laughs> along that dialogue um, there are other participants who are, you know, looking critically at those numbers, and um, then the PUC ultimately arrives at the decision. I think we've got a specific example of when you have picked the lowest hanging fruit, where do you go next? And the next place you give this example is looking at replacing machines in gas stations, or sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's so, so to the, an example. To the other question, mm -hmm. which I think Senator Brock was asking is. When does picking the low hanging fruit, when do we say enough is enough? What's the point at which mm -hmm. enough is enough? Can you move to something else you're saying? Yeah. Or the budgets can What's track the, all. What is the alarm that goes off and says, oh, enough is enough? Sure. So the alarm that goes off, um, as, as currently constructed, is um, any time we have a program or um, what we call a measure, any piece of equipment that we want to you know, promote, uh, that the cost benefit test comes back negative. So negative is means we can't promote something if it's going to cost us more than the energy savings that will be generated. In what period of time? How That's, yeah, no, that's, a, and I'm sorry it took me a while to get there because it's just so basic. It's like, yeah, we won't spend money. That's yeah. when it's no longer yeah. energy efficient. Exactly. For, for future but, reference, but Senator McDonald uses the Socratic method. I see. He will ask you questions until you give him the answer. He's looking. OK. <laughs> Until you get a clear answer, correct. What over what period of time is that test? Um, so we look at over the lifetime of the measure. So let's take um, a clothes dryer. If we know that a clothes dryer will typically last 10 years, and the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers based in Arlington, Virginia, will tell you, you know, the exact lifetime of a clothes dryer, uh, then... It's not, it's not uh, <laughs> planned obsolete. Yeah, no, they know. They know these things. Then we say, you know, if, a, if over that period of time, that, clo that efficient clothes dryer will generate $100 worth of energy savings for a customer, and then, so we have that data, and we say, well, what would it cost us to get that clothes dryer into somebody's home? Okay, maybe it costs a $50 rebate, you know, just to kind of make that person make that decision. Then we're spending 50, the person is saving 100, that's a go. 
Um, but we also add in not just the incentive, we add in the overhead, we add in the program design costs, we add in the all-in costs, what is it? everything it takes to get that person to make the more efficient decision compared to over the life of that, that product, how much energy savings is it going to generate? Um, and that's how we do the math. If, if I'm eight, I'm sure, you set the ball up there. Or you could say your closed auditor was this many years old, and if you agree to use your closed auditor only between midnight and 4 o'clock in the morning, we'll give you a stipend if you keep that promise. Because four years from now, there'll be a closed auditor that we'll switch you to that will make twice the advantage. But it's cheaper today to use that 1 o'clock in the morning power than it is to replace the, the, your closed auditor today. And that's picking which apple they choose. And they make those decisions over and over again. And if they don't, then we are mm -hmm. tossing out the window and get new people. But that's what they do. That's and the it's, job. it's hard, it's difficult to explain. Mm -hmm. And if it costs less to build new bulbs and wires and buy more electricity, it's a bargain. Yep. And each year it's tougher to make that bargain and they gotta work hard. Yep, and we're up for that challenge. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Maybe we'll have Abby or somebody back when we start with the, the other um, organization. And Perfect. Yeah, things we're ready to do. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.